Good evening, Ruchim Abayim Abotai. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night's class. Tonight's class was sponsored once again by my family's foundation, the Yiluni Shmat Rabbi Yael Bal Shem, Rabbi Yael Ben Rabbi Moshe Luantz. That is your side was today. Shut the tzaddik again, Ba'adenu. Amen, Amen. If you remember, a few years ago, we did one year something very nice. I can't compete with the level of your voices, guys. Everybody has to be quiet. Thank you. Um, if you remember a few years ago, we uh, did something in uh, his memory. And actually, I uh, kept track of people that get, sent me... Uh, okay, I will wait. Um, we kept tra- I kept track of people who sent me correspondences. Uh, and I heard a lot of nice things. So obviously, uh, these tzaddikim appreciate people that do things So we felt it was a merit for our family to uh, spread more Torah in his memory and do other good deeds as well today. Getting that out of the way, I want to say a special thank you to a gentleman who I don't know his name, so I can't say his name, but he, he wrote to me that his son fact-checked me last week, and thank God he did so, because I made one technical mistake, but a very embarrassing mistake. In a, it was a slip of a tongue. I said the Chaim uh, HaKadosh passed away 178 years ago. It was 278 years ago. Now, while I was saying it, I didn't realize what I was saying, but afterwards, when I left the place, I said to myself, wait a second. Uh, Chaim HaKadosh lived before the Baal Shem Tov. It can't be. The Baal Shem Tov died 270 years ago. So it didn't add up in my head. Uh, but thank God, this gentleman reached out to me so nicely and even sent me a picture of a source, not just saying my son checked in. It was, very, very nice way to go about things. So, whoever you are, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And tell your son to fact check me again this week. So, hopefully, we don't have any slips of the tongue. Um, yeah, it's important to be intellectually honest. And not. Rashi, many times throughout the Torah and the Gemara, writes, I don't know what it means. What do you have to write that for? Just don't say anything. Rashi doesn't explain every word. Skip some of it. Don't say something. And he deliberately writes, Eini yodea ma pirusho. So the, the, the truth is, that's the biggest pirush Rashi that there is in the whole Torah. Rashi is teaching a person, if you want to be a Talmud Chacham, or if you want to be able to explain the Torah, the first rule you have to have is to be able to say, I don't know, I made a mistake, I take it back, I forgot, Moshe Rabbeinu, many times, this week's parasha, he said, I forgot what the halacha is. If you can't do that, then, then you're in the wrong industry. You missed the whole boat. So it's actually good. It's, it's important to be able to proudly say, it was a mistake. This is the right fact. Now you got it right. So yeah, the three weeks and Sunday was a fast and I have mixed feelings about Sunday's fast. Uh, on one hand, it's, you know, it's a very special day. It's the Mishnah Buah brings down how, how close we get to Hashem on a fast and how much Shuvah and Masim Tovim we do and it makes a big Roshim in Shemaim. On the other hand, it's a day of mourning. It's a sad day. It's, you know, Shuvah Sabbat Tammuz is a day that began a, 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 it begins a period that for the Jews wasn't the luckiest of times, to put it mildly, historically. And it resembles the Chuban Beit HaMikdash. But to me, there was something a little further that bothered me. Uh, there was maybe triple or quadruple the amount of questions that come in on a regular day. And there's plenty that come in on a regular day. And they all went along the lines of this. Do I have to fast? Can I break my fast? What time is the fast over? Can I listen to music today? Can I go swimming today? Can I? And yeah, some of them are legitimate questions, of course, pregnant women, or nursing women, this, and girls in general could be, whatever, that can be discussed at a different time. Uh, don't have to fast, most fasts, and whatever. Uh, it's very possible. I'm not saying Allah Chalamah say, each one just has to look over. But when that's all you get on a fast, it's like, why doesn't anybody ask, what's, what's meaningful to do today? What, what could I do to make Mashiach come closer? What could I do to make the next year we shouldn't have a fast? Or at the Shabbat, we shouldn't have a fast. You don't even get one of those. You get so many of the looking for a way out, it irks. But then I said, you know what? It's nobody's fault. Because I remember the chidush from one of the great Gerer Rebbe's, the chidush 
Bishayim was very orgay rabbis, were very, besides being huge Tamidech Chamim, I'll see they didn't deprive you of food. Um, because, and nobody should hold back from eating, it doesn't bother me, I, I have pleasure in seeing Jews eating. But uh, anyway, the, all gay rabbis were very sharp with their tongue and big tummy de chamim, but uh, the chidush arim was very, vo- very blunt about, with his sharpness and said things exactly the way he felt about them, with, you know, in very short words. You have to be able to understand what he was saying, but in short words, straight to the point. So once he was learning with his students, the second seif in Shulchan Aruch, Or Achaim. Right at the beginning, we, uh, we know, you know, unfortunately, most people don't even know that there's other parts to the Shulchan Aruch. Thank God, most people do know that there's something like called the Mishnah Bura, the part of Or Achaim of the, Mishnah, of, of the Shulchan Aruch. And uh, he was learning with them, and, uh, that part. And right at the beginning, Maran begins with the way he begins, and the second seif, he says, that Raui is worthy for every Yerei Shamayim to be Metzel al Churban, to have tzar, to have pain from the destruction of the Temple. And he looked at his students and he says, but what happens to a Yerei Shamayim that doesn't have tzar on the Churban? So he says, are so you going to tell me he's not a Yerei Shamayim? He said, that's possible. But what happens to a Jew who wants to be a Yerei Shamayim and doesn't have tzar on the Churban? That's a very valid question. And the Imeimet with his sharpness said, then he should be made sell on his own personal khuban. He should cry over his situation that he doesn't even understand why he, th- he should be sad about the khuban. That that's the destruction of where people got to. There was a, another very famous Hasidic Rebbe, who I, I'll quote one more thing from Blinad, if I remember later on. The Kotzka Rebbe is itself also of extremely sharp tongue, very, 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 you know, Kotzka was... The, the resemblance of brilliance and straight, very straightforward, very sharp. So, it's a, there's a known chidush from the Kotzka Rebbe. In Halakha, it's brought down, I'm sure I said this chidush in the past, because my, my Rebbe used to tell it to us every year at the beginning of the three weeks. This was part of the beginning of the three-week speech. Um, and Shukhan Uchut says that if a person, during the week, not on Shabbat, Pika Balat is also on Shabbat, by the way, but if a person is uh, eating a meal, has to say and on the table there's knives so he shouldn't say until he removes the knives now, according to the Kabbalah even on Shabbat we do that but uh, according to the Nigla and Halakha only during the week why? so it's brought down Halakha based on the Gemara that there was a story that a guy was saying and he came to the blessing of Bonei Yerushalayim and when he came to the blessing of Bonei Yerushalayim, suddenly it hit him. Wait a second, so there's no Yerushalayim, and I'm not in Yerushalayim, there's no Beit HaMikdash, and Am Yisrael really should look so differently, and everything about the Jewish nation should be so different. And, it, and he got depressed. And he got so depressed that he became suicidal, he took a knife from the table, he stabbed himself, and he died. So it says in Halakha, therefore, when you say Berkat HaMazon during the week, on Shabbat, there's no mourning. So it's not applicable. There is, whatever, see, we, we don't do it anyway. It's for other reasons. But in the Nigla, there's no more. It's, it's, not, it's on Shabbat, you don't have it. But during the week, take the knife away, so like this, when you get to Bonei Yushalayim, we'll, be, we'll take a safety precaution. That was Chazal's version of masks. That was a safety precaution. When you get to Bonei Yushalayim, you shouldn't stab yourself. So the Kotzka Rebbe asked, is there really anybody that's going to stab himself today over Yushalayim? I know a lot of Palestinians backed by a guy named Bennett that are stabbing Jews these days. Uh, maybe even paid for by Bennett. But uh, beyond that, uh, in Jerusalem uh, and in America, we, I don't even know if we know that there is a Jerusalem anymore. They don't even let us go see it. Uh, every time we think we'll be able to go, they push it off again. It's, it's very, you know, I'm saying it in humor, but it's very sad at the end of the day. If you really think about it, it's not Bennett. It's not, these are all puppets in God's puppet show. That means that Kodesh is telling us that we're not worthy to be in the land of Israel, even as visitors. One of the curses in the, in the parashat of the Tochachaz, that the land shouldn't throw you out. That means Israel threw us out. And I'm not here to say Musa, I don't say Musa. One day if I'll ever be righteous, then I'll start saying Musa. And maybe then I'll understand why you shouldn't say Musa. But uh, one way or the other. But I think maybe part of the reason is, is that we forgot that there's a Jerusalem anyway. So God said, you don't want it. So now I'll take it away completely. 
I said this last year. People got very upset at me, maybe even rightfully so. It's hard to hear these words. And different people responded in different ways. And I said, I'm not, God forbid, being negative or criticizing. I'm just, I have an innocent question. Take a survey amongst our boys and girls between 12 and 30 years old in the past 20 years during spring break. Where did they go? Did they go to Cancun or did they go to Jerusalem? Did they go to Miami on yeshiva break? Or did they go to Jerusalem? Obviously, we're more connected to Miami than to Jerusalem. Simple as that. When you're connected to somewhere, you go proactively. You don't, oh, I'm connected, but stay away. I love the Sefer Torah, so I hug it and kiss it. If I didn't like the Sefer Torah, I would stay away from it. The fact that instinctively, when a Jew thinks, I, I have three days off work, I want to go somewhere. The instinct is not to go to Jerusalem. It shows how removed we are from the idea of Jerusalem at all. Like, Shall I? Okay, now what? I ate this dosha and this, but so it's not. But it's not really our fault. Kotzker Rebbe says so. There's nobody's going to stab himself over Jerusalem. So what do we have this halacha for? So he says the halacha wasn't given because we're really scared somebody will stab himself. That was only done once in history. For that we wouldn't make such a gzera. The halacha is that every person, every time he says Birkat Amazon, should remember that one time in Jewish history there was somebody who cared enough about Jerusalem that it made him so sad that he was suicidal. At least we should be aware that there's something like that. Lavdil, not Lavdil in a bad way of Tumanta, just generations and years and years later. Um, in 1967, when the Israeli military conquered Jerusalem, uh, the Israeli military didn't conquer nothing. When Hashem gave a gift to Am Yisrael that they got back to Kotel and Harabait uh, Biadenu, I don't know if that was a good thing, by the way, because of Pialachatz and Isukaret to go up to Harabait. But uh, there's no heta in the world, no matter what people think. But uh, the kota was a nice benefit. My grandfather, Zechat Sadiq Libacha, used to describe to me how, how many times the Arabs tried to attack him on the way to the kota and all the different miracles he had, including one time that he shared with me a very interesting story. He was going together with his chavruta, Bibon al Chai Sharabi, Zechat Sadiqim Libacha, two big tzadikim, great Kabbalists of, pre- of the previous generation. And they were walking, it was during the three weeks, to do tikkun chatzot. Every night we do Tikkun Chatzot, depending on the night, if it's only Tikkun Rachel, Tikkun Re'ah, but some version of it. And, uh, but during the three weeks, we do Tikkun Chatzot twice, at night and in the afternoon, because it's the time of Avelut Chuban Abay. So they were walking in the afternoon to go do Tikkun Chatzot Barakot. And Yemach Shemam, there were a few of our first cousins, the Arabs, that uh, decided that they see two old men walking to the Kotel. My grandfather was much younger than Rav Sharabi, and proportion, not much, but a little bit, and uh, they're going to beat them up. That was the plan of action. Now this was before they got sophisticated like today with rockets and this and that. I don't even know if they had knives then. You know, they were a very primitive uh, nation. And uh, they had sticks. So they came with wooden sticks to take them apart. And he told me there were six of them. Six Bnei Ishmael came to beat them up. Rav Sharabi, the great Kabbalist, and my grandfather, the great Kabbalist. The two great Kabbalists of Israel, they came to beat them up on the way to the court. They had nothing better to do with themselves. And Rav Sharabi realized that they were in danger. He said he doesn't know what he said, but he saw his lips move for a second, and they froze. Their hands were up like that, they froze like that, standing. They couldn't move, paralyzed, standing. I would do that to most of the Knesset. Really, <laughs> the way they behave. I don't know if you watch anything that goes on lately, but crazy, N- nuts. They're all not, uh, I don't know. you gotta be psycho to walk in there though. It's a danger zone. Chazid and the people that are Yerei Hashem, you know, 17, 16, whatever seats they have, that are forced because the Gdolei Yisrael forced them to go in just to be mochel, kdushat Hashem a little bit. This week, one night there was a filibuster in the Israeli Knesset. Listen how insane this is. The so filibuster means they waste people's time for hours and hours, hoping that the opposition will, if some of the seat, votes will leave already because they won't stay there. That's uh, hoping that the coalition, I mean, and that's one of the ways that, one of the uh, bully tactics of getting politics done. In this case, it's good. We need this to happen. So how do you accomplish that? By law, every Knesset member is allocated a certain amount of time for each thing that's being voted on to speak. So the opposition people maximize their time, it's three minutes, each one, 
and there's 50 something of them. So multiply 50 something by three minutes by three laws, that's a full night. So they were there until 7, 10 a.m. <laughs> from the afternoon the day before to get by some dumb votes on nasty subjects. So at like 6 o'clock in the morning, there was a guy named Yitzchak Pindrus. He's a Chavei Knesset from Yadut HaTorah, Chaim Kanievsky's messenger in the Knesset. And he got up to speak, but he had nothing to say. Right? This is pointless. This is just a... So he decided he's going to do something nice. He's going to say Birkot HaShacha. All these people, and I'm in. He's there all night. It's time to say Birkot HaShacha. So he gets up and he says Birkot HaShacha. If I would have not seen this on a video, I wouldn't believe that this happened. He says Birkot HaShacha. When he got to the blessing, Shelo Asani Isha, a huge percentage of the Knesset stormed out. Because the prayer is racist. That's what we got to in the Israeli Knesset. That's what we got to in the Israeli Knesset. You want to know how you explain this? I'll explain it to you. Mashiach, those are all true, by the way. And I spoke about that in the past. But I'll explain it to you with a little humor, because these things are so crazy. There's no way to deal with it except to laugh it off. Besides the fact that they got it all wrong. They don't understand what the blessing means, so they got upset and they left. If they would understand what it means, they would actually be proud. They would have said, thank you for saying it. They, they missed the boat completely. That's you know, a separate issue. But there's an old tale. People said it as a tale. It actually has sources in Jewish Sfarim. Ben Shchai brings it down in one of his Sfarim. And there's another sefer from an old Turkish Kabbalist that was written about 300 years ago that he brings it down in his sefer. So it's obviously not just a tale. At, uh, very sh shortly, there were two brothers. One was poor, one was rich. The rich guy had no children. The poor guy had a lot of children. Maybe that's why he was poor. He had to pay a lot of tuitions. And uh, yeah, that's normally what happens. And he, uh, each brother felt bad for the other. Dad, so, and the guy with a lot of kids says, you know, my brother might have all these millions in the bank, but what's his life worth? He got no family, no kids, no this, no that. The other guy says, my brother might have a beautiful family, uh, but he has no money, he can't pay his bills, can't feed his children. Come home with the kids crying, we're hungry, daddy. It's not, uh, it's also not a life. And every night, in the middle of the night, one guy would take hay, that was uh, food, whatever, from his, the, the rich brother, and go to the poor brother to throw it over his fence so he should have what to have. The poor brother felt bad for his rich brother and said, you know what, at least let him wake up to a surprise. He'll feel like God dropped something from heaven, he'll feel good about himself. And he would go take from what he had and throw it. One night the poor brother said, I got to know who's sending me the money. My rich brother, you know, rich people live in a lot of hallucinations. But I'm poor, I'm realistic. God ain't dropping anything from heaven. Somebody's doing this. I'm not a charity case. I got to know who's sending me this charity. He stays up, he waits. Sees a guy throwing something over, goes running after him, runs, 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 catches him, sees his brother. Realizes what's going on, tells him the back and forth. And I don't remember the exact words of the Ben Yishchai, but it's roughly, They hugged each other. It was an emotional moment. And Akash Baruch said, Over here is where the temple is going to be built. I, I'm sure when you were in kindergarten, your Morat told you that story. But it's not just a story, it actually has a source. In the Sfarim HaKdoshim. Not in Chazal, but in the Sfarim HaKdoshim. In Chazal, there's other reasons. A promise to Binyamin and many other reasons why we have the Temple Mount where it is. So, Ad Khan to do the Beit Mikdash. Now my cynical commentaries. Lahavdil, Elif al Feavdalut. I know about another two brothers. One was poor, had a lot of kids. One was rich, had no kids. Up to here the story sounds very similar. And each one was thinking about the other. But there was one difference. They were progressive liberals. So the rich guy said, population control. Where's the arrogance of my brother to bring all these kids without having a living for, to feed them? And then take me, the taxpayer's money, to feed them? And the poor brother said, rich people, we should storm their stores like on Fifth Avenue, loot Saks Fifth Avenue, loot, loot Gucci. Because lives matter when it's convenient to say so. And every night, the poor brother would go to the rich brother's field and steal from him. And the rich brothers would go to the poor brothers' field to steal from him. And of course, they didn't consider it stealing because they, uh, I'm taking what's mine, the taxpayer's dollar back, and the other guy's taking what the rich man, Robin Hood, he is. And he's taking back what he deserves. And one night, the rich brother got fed up, and he's like, I got to see who's stealing from me every night. This is not going to go on any longer. And he goes out this field, and he's with a crew, and they're watching, and they see a guy coming and stealing. 
And they say, oh, we got the guy, let's go chase him. They chase him down, they run, they run, they run, they catch him, and he sees his brother. And they looked at each other with hate and divided America, canceled fireworks, said that holidays shouldn't be called by their name, even legal ones. And God in heaven smiled and said, over here we're going to build the Israeli Knesset. That's my little uh, commentaries on this week's uh, episodes in Israel, <laughs> in short. I think in that you understood everything else I think about what's going on in Israel. But anyway, on a more serious note, yeah, so the Chidusha Arim, as we said, said, if somebody doesn't understand why it says in Maran that we look like Shamayim to be Metzer al Chuban, he should be Metzer at least on his Chuban. But because the generations got weaker and we got later on in time, I don't think we could judge people that way. Because honestly, ask the average person, based on Yiddash, what's that? You weren't there, your father wasn't there, your grandfather wasn't there, you didn't see pictures, and today everything has to be animated 3D with a lot of with surround sound. We don't have any of that with the Beit Midash, so we have no way to relate to it. So you can't expect somebody to mourn over something he doesn't know and doesn't understand. And we don't know, and we don't understand what the Beit Midash is, was, means, anything to do with it, so, yeah, we can't be expected. And that's why Chazal say a very interesting thing. There's a difference between the Bavli and the Yushalmi and the way these wor- the last words go. But the first words are the same. Every generation of the temple wasn't built in its time. So it's either Ki'ilu Nechav, it's as if it was destroyed, or Ki'ilu Hichrivo, as if we destroyed it. But they really mean the same thing if you look in the Yushalmi. If it wasn't built, so by default we destroyed it. Because what does that mean? By default, we destroyed it because if we would have done things differently, then it would have been built. So today's generation, I don't know if Hashem expects us to mourn the temple because we don't understand what the temple is. But He expects us to mourn the fact that we don't even care enough to do something proactively to get the temple to be rebuilt. That's really where the mourning starts and ends. But honestly, mourning doesn't get anybody anywhere. It's a nice emotional way of venting things and whatever, but does it get anybody anywhere? God forbid nobody should ever know, but when somebody stands by a funeral and cries, does it help anybody? If you're a psychologist, you might say it's good emotionally to let it out, whatever. It could be. Yeah, I'm not saying not. The Gemara says that God believes Yishi Sichena and other things about tears. But beyond that, does it get anybody anywhere? No. Abba Yashiv didn't shed a tear in his life, except for the Shabbat, like he note for one minute. Other than that, never shed a tear in his life. He buried children alive, not even by his children's funerals. Because in Seichel, Hashem said to be happy. That's it, case closed. Once he was asked, I, it says in Chazal clearly that a mourner has three days lebechi, three days they should cry. He said that's for somebody who needs it. That was his answer. Now again, I'm not saying we're not Rabbi Yashar, we should get ideas, of course, we're different, and it's okay, we can cry. We should never have reasons to cry except for tears for joy. But uh, in the concept. But what's... Uh, let's take a, an easier example to relate to. Somebody sees somebody, God forbid, getting hit by a car. We should never know, we should never know, but these things happen all the time. And it's an ugly scene. The guy splattered on the floor, blood everywhere, and this person has such a big heart and loves people so much, bursts out crying. Is that a hero? No, you're a murderer. Pick up the phone and call an ambulance. Right now is not the time to cry. When the guy is in ICU and being taken care of, then cry if you want. But right now, we got to get into action. So people that sit on the floor the whole three weeks and cry, which I don't know if there is anybody like that anymore today, but even if there was, that's nice and dandy, but that's not going to make it happen. The three weeks has to end and be converted into happy days like Chazal promised they will be by springing into action, by doing something proactive. And are you going to say, what happened to all the tzaddikim of all the generations and whatever? So two things. Number one, I don't know. It didn't work, obviously, because the sheikh didn't come. Number two, the answer is very simple, because the darker it is, the more light makes a difference. So this generation is so dark that the tiniest thing that we do is such a big deal in Shemaim. And the Rambam's generation, there was so much, you had Shemaim everywhere, so its fault weren't, it, it took a lot more to get to those levels. Today, what a kid does, the tiniest mitzvah is such a big deal in Shemaim, it turns the heavens upside down. Because the generation, unfortunately, is so orphaned. And that's why, and the Chofetz Chaim says that, that wasn't mine. And that's why Dafka, our generation, can bring Mashiach. 
Why also is there an obligation to be proactive? So we'll take it a step further, based on the Yisod that we once said, but uh, we're going to give it a new addition with a story from the Regina Rebbe Zetzal. Abi Yisrael Mirujin, Zechot Tzadik V'Kadosh Tzivacha. He used to have a custom that every day after Shacharit, he would finish his prayer. He added, in Rujin, they have a lot of things that they say after Shacharit. Uh, and this, and Imami, and all different things that they had on there, all important. The Schirot also, it's just many mitzvot I say that everybody could get every day. Um, and many other things. So after all that, he would put his talit over his head, he would bend over with his hand, or whatever. And it was known that uh, he would see things in Shemayim then. And people would wait until he was done, because when he picked up his head, a lot of times he would say things that had to do with people, that to, whatever, different things. Especially people that came to him to pray for them, they would wait, because a lot of times afterwards he would pick up his head and he would say, your problem solved already, go. Or if somebody asked for advice, he would... Uh, they said, he, literally, when Shammah went up to Shammah, he would see things clearly and come back and give a report. One day there was one of his students who started doubting. What does the Rebbe already see? Yeah, a few blessings. I could also give blessings. Who said that it's true? Who says that? He decided he's waiting to ask him what he saw. Because not every day did the Rebbe say anything. Many, most days he was quiet. Only on certain days. I'm going to ask him what he saw. And then I'm going to verify the facts. This is what he thought. True going to know. Today we have plenty of those. So he waits for the Rebbe, the Rebbe's with his head down, and he's waiting, and that day the Rebbe kept his head down a long time. Maybe he was doing a filibuster to this guy. Mm -hmm. And then he picks up his head, and the Talmud goes running to him, and says, uh, Rebbe, what'd you see? Now the Regina was a very nice person. <laughs> he, instead of throwing him out like he should have, not even, or just ignoring him, because honestly that's what he deserved, he actually answered him. He said, I saw that Hashem really has the Beis HaMikdash ready. And the Mashiach's between us and he's ready to reveal himself. And that technically today still Yerushalayim should be built and everything should be back to normal. And Now the student's like, okay, the Rebbe's already giving me hallucination facts. You know, it's based on nothing. So he doesn't, instead of staying quiet, he continues. He says, well, so why isn't it happening? If you saw, so you saw the whole story, so why not? So the Regina tells him, because Hashem is waiting for a few lost souls that if Mashiach comes today, they're going to be wiped out forever. And he feels bad that Jews should be wiped out, so he wants them to be saved, so he's pushing it off, waiting for them. So then this wisecrack tells the Rebbe, so the whole Jewish nation has to suffer for a few, soul, a few lost souls? And the Rebbe says, really, I also think like you. I don't think it's fair. But the fact that you think like you, I'm surprised, because you're one of those souls. Nice from the regime, really. but uh, it goes very well with another story that a posek once said, said over. Dayan and Alacha said over an unbelievable story. He said one day somebody came to him during the three weeks and he needs a head to listen to, for his wife to listen to music. Of course, he's not going to say himself, so blame it on the wife. Whenever anybody comes to my wife, I right away know this stinks. It's him. He's the prowl. No. The girls know halacha better than the boys. And in yeshiva, they don't teach much halacha, unfortunately. The girls in Beis Yaakov, they teach them so much halacha, they could be dayanot. Not literally, but theoretically. Kitzur shuchan aruch, everything they know about heart. Unreal. Years ago, we used to teach boys, that were yeshiva boys, that thank God weren't exposed to society, so they didn't know the garbage of the world. Before they got married, we used to teach them how to be married. You know, it shouldn't be totally embarrassing. Today we teach them Ilchot Shabbat because they come the first week and the wife knows everything and he knows nothing and then she's like, and he's the yeshiva boy. She doesn't realize that he knows the old shas, but halacha, he was never taught, it's not his fault. But uh, in order to avoid that discomfort, we teach them some halacha also, it's good for them. But anyway, so Posek said over like this. He said that he has a guy come to him, and he says, uh, it's during the three weeks, my wife needs to listen to music. In a moment, I'll tell you what my opinion about the whole music subject is in general, not mine, who cares about my opinion, what my Oshiva, Absalom Zaman, Oroch, Zechot Tzadik Levachat told me himself. Um, but I'm just saying this for the story. So he told him, what do you mean, music? It's three weeks, you know, listen to music. So he says, no, but my wife suffers from some emotional issues and whatever and that. So music helps her, so she needs to listen to music. So maybe it's considered a fuah. So the Dayan said, no, maybe. He didn't answer him yes or no, he just left it as a maybe. 
But he wanted to hear from the Dayan that it's okay, because he wanted to calm his guilt down. So he says, it's not just Rifua, she's depressed. Depressed people could kill themselves. So really, it's a Safek Pikuach Nefesh. So the, the Dayan tells him, Safek Pikuach Nefesh, of course, the Chatechila, she should listen to music. What's the question? Of course, she should. But the Dayan picked up that this guy, his whole story was made up on the spot, and he was just looking for him to say, it's okay to calm his guilt down that he should be able to listen to music. So as he's walking out of his, his office, the Dayan calls him back and says, but I just want to tell you one little thing. You put me in a very tough spot now. So he said, what do you mean? He said, a lot of times people call me for information about your daughters in Shaduchim. Al if somebody has a mental illness, you have to disclaim, disclose it. So now I have to tell them that your wife's suicidal. And I'm not sure how that's going to work. I wish you would have not asked me the question. And suddenly he jumps, no, no, it's not so bad, she's fine, it's just a little bit. You get... so, so when you want this, uh, suddenly the story is this way. And then you wonder why the Beit HaMikdash is not being built. Just stop making a fool out of yourself, then stop making a fool out of the Torah, then stop making a fool out of me, and then we'll talk about the Beit HaMikdash. But there's an order of the way things have to work. It doesn't work like that. Many years ago, there was an ad that somebody paid for it to be publicized in many magazines that I, what it was about makes no difference. The concept I appreciated. It says, how can we say that we want Yerushalayim when our head is in Italy and Paris? I had pictures of Milano and parts of Paris and a little kotel in the bottom corner. It's a big step in life not to lie to yourself. It's a very, very big step. Unfortunately, truth today is not something that's... Uh, I don't even know if people think about saying the truth. It used to be, we'd at least take it into consideration. Today, truth means it makes no difference anymore. It's whatever my warped reality is, that's, that's what became true. It's... Uh, All right, here's, uh, you'll get one more cynical comment from me out of uh, on today on this week's occurrences in Israel. I just I take these things very personal. What should we do? So, in a quick assessment of what's going on in Israel, here's the way I analyze it all. Um, let's just assume that some of the yeshiva boys won't understand this completely, but those of us who uh, were raised differently at, or raised ourselves differently at one point will. Uh, so our, my childhood heroes, I guess, in one way or the other, were Superman, Pinocchio, and Snow White. Because each one resembled something special. And when you're a kid, you always want an association with something special. <coughs> so one day Superman, Snow White, and Pinocchio met. And each one came with bragging rights. That's what superheroes do. Superman's I'm the strongest superhero in the world. Nobody could defeat me. Great. Snow White, I'm the most beautiful little princess. So cute. Nobody could beat me. Great. Pinocchio says, I'm the master liar of the world. I've never been a liar like me. Look at my nose. That's it. It says it all. The story says it all. Nobody could beat me. But how do we know who's really the superhero, the, the super story in all of them? So they decide they're going to take a group of judges, and each one's going to test each one in his talent, and they're going to come with an assessment of who's really who they claim to be. They agree upon who's judging them. There's a closed room. Each one's going to go in separate and get tested. Super, Superman goes in. They test him with this, with that, with the other. He's a superhero. You know, he climbs up the walls. He jumps down. Everything's unbelievable. Comes out with a big trophy. He passed. He's exactly what he said he was. Snow White goes in. Okay, looks. is a very quick assessment. Yeah, she's beautiful. Here you go. Comes out all proud. I'm the princess. Pinocchio goes in, and before he goes in, he laughs at them. He says, wait and see what a trophy I'm going to get. Five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, half an hour, an hour, and two hours, three, he's not coming out. Finally, three and a half hours later, he comes out. No trophies, all sad, crying. And Superman and Snow White say, why are you crying? What's, uh, and where's your trophy? We thought you were the biggest liar in the world. He says, I don't know. I thought I would get one. But then they told me about this guy named Bennett, and they said he beat me, and I can't get one anymore. Who is he? I never heard of him before. That's my assessment of all Israeli politics at once. Um, if, if, if we needed reasons to cry about the destruction of the temple, so yeah, we just look at what's going on right now. But in case 
they didn't want, uh, in case they didn't want to understand, here's just an odd fact that you can look up online in three seconds. From the day this new government, the clowns, was sworn in, COVID came back to Israel. The country that came out of COVID first, that opened first, that got who knows what percentage of their population vaccinated, that this, that, 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 that. They formed a coalition against God. God said, now all your vaccines ain't going to work. But wait a second, Pfizer said that they're effective 88% against the Delta strain. And Israel today said 47% of the people that tested positive are vaccinated. But now the media has a big problem. Because for a year and a half they were selling us a story that the Haredim are the ones who are spreading COVID because we have yeshivas. And they did 30,000 tests in Orthodox communities in the past three days. And in the total number, 95% of the infectious rate in Israel is secular Jews. 4% are Arabs. And 1% is Haredi Jewry. And I just want to know, where's the media that was preaching against the yeshivas now blessing them, saying it's the only place that's COVID-free? Hypocrites, lowlifes. When it was convenient to bash God, then we did it. But then, I have one limut zchut. I used to be very positive and say nice to they don't know better honestly I ran out of those excuses for them I have a new limut zchut they're not Jewish and that's it they got confused in the hospital I have no other explanation it doesn't make sense to me that a Jew could behave this way it, it literally does not make sense to me that a Jew could behave this way but there was one happy moment in the Knesset this week there's a Knesset member who's a Jew who says he's a Jew at least his name is Ofer Kasif and he's part of an Arab party. A Jew that's part of an Arab party. So he gave a speech in the Knesset this week about all the reasons why Israel's in apartheid and the land is stolen. And honestly, he spoke like a Rosh Shiva. I give the guy credit. Took out a Chumash, opened up Parashat Breshit, quoted the first Rashi in Chumash Breshit. Amar Abi Yitzchak, Abi Yitzchak said that the why did the Torah begin Breshit Ba'alokim? Because it's going to be a time that the Umot are going to come and say, Listimatem, you stole the land. And what are we going to answer? Build so no at God's will. Netanalachem, for a certain amount of time during exile, he gave it to you. Build so no at God's will, because he owns the whole land. Netanalachem, and he gave it to us as Jews. And then he flipped the pages a few, a few Chumashim later. And read a pasuk, and Rashi explains that when Am Yisrael doesn't go according to the rules of the Torah, then they lose their right on the land of Israel. So he said, your only justification to be here and not to call yourselves an apartheid state is the fact that you say that God gave the Jewish nation the land of Israel. But you guys are trampling God now. So he didn't give you the land. So give it back to the Palestinians. Now he didn't say it for the right reasons. He's a representative of the terrorists. But at the end of the day, he's right I have a, I had, he's not alive anymore. Passed away recently. I, I had a close friend who was many years older than me. It was a pilot, an Israeli uh, Air Force pilot in, in, a couple, in two of the Israeli wars. And at one point he was, a cap, he was taken captive in Syria. He was tortured terribly. He had physical ailments the rest of his life till he passed away. Hashem Yerachim, we should never know. And he told me when they used to torture him, as we're talking about the end of the 60s, and they, when they would torture him, they would tell him the same thing, same idea. They would say, what are you fighting for? He would say, the land. Which land? Israel. What gives you the right to the land of Israel? We were here first. They'd say, what do you mean? I'm Jewish. It's the Jewish land. He said, what about you as Jewish? No Shabbat, no kosher, no this. No, there's nothing Jewish about you. You can't not be Jewish and fight for a Jewish land. That doesn't work. And that's the way the Syrian terrorists were tortured as Jewish pilot. Came back to Israel when he was finally released to one of these deals that they make, with the, you know, the trade of prisoners of war. And he became a, a big, big Talmud Chacham. He went straight to Yeshiva as soon as he was healed in the hospital, like physically ill. Because the Syrians had to teach him what... So that's really where I'm going with this. It's very hard to say that we want Jerusalem and this and that when all this hypocrisy is going on, all this craziness is going on. But we're not going to fix the world. Um, so at least we could do two things. Number one, pray for these miserable souls that they should find a life and be happy. And maybe then they'll stop bugging uh, religious people and let people that have faith keep their faith and protect the world. 
And we should really pray for them to do tshuva. It's sad. If they're Jewish, they should do tshuva. And if not, they should get out of here. But one way or the other. Um, and number two, what does Hashem want from us? And on a very personal level. So God said it. He said the problem was sinat chinam, a.k.a. the lack of peace. And it won't change until that changes. It's not that complicated. He gave the formula very simply. And the fact that we don't want to hear it because it's inconvenient or hard to live up to is our problem. It's not Hashem's problem. It's not Mashiach's problem. Mashiach's actually suffering. Mashiach says that he's bandaged every day. He takes his bandages off. On. Obviously, it's a parable. But uh, I mean, he's suffering greatly that he can't reveal himself. So how do, how do you acquire peace in the world? All the best. You should have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbat. What's, uh, so I'm not here to fix the world, and I don't know how you acquire peace completely. If I did, I'd bring global peace, and we'd solve all the problems of the world at once. But I'll give you the first foundations of, pe of, of living a peaceful life. And peace is not only with others, by the way. I think the first step of peace is to be, have peace within yourself. That's the most important peace. That's why it's the biggest blessing also. Besides, Chazal said, uh, what's the cleat that's Marzik Bracha, the vessel that uh, holds blessing? Peace. I once had a story, don't learn from this anything. There's not a zgula, there's not advice, there's not anything. But sometimes I'm in my moods and I do random things. I was speaking somewhere in South America and it was a long day. They, I went there, I was told I'm speaking twice and going back home. And from the plane, there wasn't even breakfast. It was from school to school, from shul to shul, speak, just to speech. At a certain point, enough, you know. Lunch at least, a slice of pizza, something. And I'm sure they didn't mean bad. They just had an opportunity, somebody to give chizuk to a community that didn't have anybody at that point to do it. So why not? Let's squeeze it until the end. So we went, I landed at 9 in the morning. That means I left the U.S. already at 5.30 in the morning, or 6 in the morning. I was up already at 2 in the morning. You could understand, as the hours were going, my body was uh, starting to resent this. This went on until what they made the big speech. The big speech started at 9.30 at night in the main synagogue, sold out. Three floors, everything full. Okay, you see a crowd like that, they're thirsty, they're coming 9.30 at night, they're, you give it all you got. Fine, big siyad d'shmai, an hour and a half, that unbelievable, kabalat al machut shamai, ganeidin, it was worth the whole day's work. And with that I thought I'm going to my hotel, hopefully getting food and leaving the next morning. Little did I know that they were told that there's questions and answers afterwards. Why not? Questions and answers. Thank you, Tzadik. Oh, yeah, very special of you. That's good enough. When I was in that community, even this I didn't get. <laughs> hey, you'll take care of this for me. Thank you. Bekitza. These days I learned, you may not need me. But, uh, okay, questions and answers, fine. So we do an open Q&A live. I wish everybody's going to leave, and that's going to be the end. It's 11 o'clock at night. They're all there. I later on found out that half these people are so wealthy, they don't have to go to work in the morning. And of course they're there. It was the rush, you know, there's entertainment tonight. And they were told that they could ask on any subject in the world they want. So that's already entertaining. Because this guy is attacking Judaism, and the other guy is asking about uh, diversity, and the other one's about this, and the other, you know, all different subjects. Uh, and in the hours, of, the clock is ticking and ticking and ticking. Hey, finally, 2 o'clock in the morning, I put an end to it. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. I'm up for 24 hours straight, speaking for about 17 of them. I am done. Tomorrow morning, I'm out of here. I don't know if I'm coming back after this, but I hope I had a positive impact on you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. A roaring round of applause, very nice. Everybody's very polite over there. You know, Latins know how to do that well. And I'm walking out of the door, and the guy who brought me already started feeling guilty, finally. And uh, he's escorting me out to the driver who's going to take me to the hotel, and then a couple hours later, pick me up to take me to school and to the airport. And a girl comes, standing, blocking the door. I'm like, I didn't think it had to do with me. I thought she didn't realize. She's standing, talking on the phone. I went, I said, excuse me, ma'am, can I walk by? She says, no. Now this guy who brought me, he's with me, and he tells her in Spanish, like in a very harsh tone of voice, I didn't understand what he said, but like, move. He says, no, I need to speak to him. I waited all night, I sat here till two in the morning, blah, 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 blah. So this guy tells me in Hebrew, thinking that she didn't understand, turned out she did. 
She's the daughter of the richest guy in the community. There's no way to say no to her. Give her two minutes, see what she needs. Hashem should forgive me. I really should have had more patience and been nicer and everything and whatever, but it turned out good, so I guess that was also me, Bashet. She tells me, listen, I'm, uh, my father's the wealthiest man in town, so people are intimidated by me as a result. I'm also very well educated. That's also people are intimidated by me because of that. And I, it's, I can't get married. It's a problem. I need you to give me advice. How am I going to get married? I want to get married. I want to build a family. I said, a shadchan I'm not. A kabbalist I'm not. Your father's not my donor, so I have no obligations to you either. Due to all three, I got nothing to tell you. I said, I can give you a blessing, but let me tell you something. My blessings don't work, so it's a waste of your time. But if it'll make you feel good, I'll give you a blessing. Why not? So if you want, give me a name. I'll even pray for you. No, I need advice. Now, the only thing I could think of at that time was my pillow, my pillow, my pillow, my pillow. <laughs> Honestly, nothing else. I'm not even hearing. Uh, I'm not interested. Shem should forgive me. It's really rude. It's disgusting. I did a lot of truva since then. I changed. So, just to push her off, I said, listen, the Torah says that blessings only lay, lay in a place of this peace. you have any brothers and sisters? She said, yeah. I said, how many? She said, three. I said, they're older than you or younger than you? She said, younger. I said, you fight with them? She says, all the time. I said, if you don't fight with them for 30 days, you'll get engaged. Have a good day. <laughs> really? I'm so happy. Thank you. Blah, blah. I became a celebrity. What did I find out the next afternoon? That she took me seriously. That wasn't the plan. And that there's a whole community in Latin America with a stopwatch. 30 days. Now, I knew I had my way out. She's going to fight with somebody in 30 days. So, you know, I always have a backup plan. But, uh, what a kiddush Hashem. She started dating a guy a week later. Now, over there, they date for a long time, months. So, 30 days wasn't an option. That was part of the craziness in what she understood. Now, I never even said that she's going to get engaged in 30 days. That wasn't even what I said as a joke. I said, do it for 30 days. It'll help you get it. But she understood it otherwise. Now, what my, what my side of the story is makes no difference anymore. So he dates this guy a few dates, and he's not from that country, he's from a different country. And he comes to her one night, and he tells her, listen, I don't want to shock you, and this, and that, and that. Let me tell you the facts. I run businesses all over the world. I can't stay here forever doing nothing. I can't waste my time. I'm not a youngster either. I want to build a family or whatever. You get the gist. You're an educated girl. You get what I am. I get what you are. If we could move quickly and get engaged in the next few days, I'll propose one of these days. You'll have a fancy proposal up to par. Everything will be beautiful. A rock bigger than your finger. Everything is going to be perfect. But it has to happen. Day 29, she got engaged by force. <laughs> <laughs> An expedited process. Two weeks of dating. Satma style. Unbelievable. When I thought about it years later, I said, I'm not going to say over the story a lot because then people are going to turn this into something. God forbid. But the idea is true. Nothing to do with marriage. The idea in general is true. If somebody can keep the peace in his house for a month, yeah, he's going to see good things in life. Because Hashem says, blessing will only dwell with his peace. And if somebody feels that the blessing is not dwelling, that means there is no peace. Because if there would have been peace, Hashem already said that that's a kliyam achzik bracha. Now, sometimes you think there's peace and there's no peace because you don't know that the other person's keeping inside up to the sky and back about you. Either because they're scared to tell you or for other sad reasons. So that's like somebody who has a leak in the basement and doesn't know what happens until there's already two feet of water in the floor. So maybe dig deeper and make sure that there's real peace in the house and that things are really run the right way. But that's not a joke. And if Amisa would be able to be in peace even for one minute, not two Shabbatot, like Hazal, even one minute, that would be enough of a reason to bring Mashiach. And if Mashiach didn't come, that means we can't even live civilly with each other for one minute. And unfortunately, it's not an exaggeration. That is the old famous, thank God it's not true, Jewish tale of the guy who moves to a deserted island and his kids come to visit him after two years and they see he built himself this huge mansion and three synagogues. And he's the only one there. So the son goes to his father and says, Dad, what did you build three synagogues for? They said, that one I pray in most Shabbat thought. That one sometimes I pray in, and that one I'll never walk into. <laughs> That's the Jewish story. It's true. Every year I say this on Shabbat, every single year. And it doesn't go over well, but it's the truth. When it doesn't go over well, I, repeat it. I keep on repeating it, because then I know it's really true. If you belong to Ponovich, 
And one day Mashiach reveals himself and he belongs to Satma. Are you going to accept him or are you going to say it can't be, you're not Mashiach? If you belong to Satma, one day Mashiach comes with a blue and white yarmulke, are you going to accept him or are you going to say it can't be? What does that mean? That idealistically, even if we don't fight physically or in other nasty ways, idealistically we can't live together even for one minute. And then I see Tish above again, keynote. It's already a mockery. It's embarrassing. Somebody has to do like to really shake the world up a little bit. I remember when a guy who I'm very close to went into Mahana of Steyman's itself. Schutay again aleinu. Steyman was very. Uh, he doesn't need my approvals. But you know, he's, he, he was on target, very down to earth, we'll call it. He understood the dynamics of what was going on in the generation very well. And he came to him with this brilliant idea that uh, in Chazal, there's many sources, the Kabbalat al Machut Shamayim, definitely massive scales, stops tragedies and brings good things. And so he had a way, he figured, he spent months on this. And he's a wealthy man, and he had consulting companies and advertising. Uh, He's going to make this event. He has a way to figure out. He's six million Jews are going to say Shema Yisrael and do Kabbalat Malchut, Ol Malchut Shamayim live at the same time all over the world. Not a few hundred thousand. Six million Jews. And it sounds holy, no? I think everybody would have been part of that. And he went to Rav Steyman to get his endorsement before he launches his campaign with the date and whatever and gets all the schools involved. You know, it's a whole movement to get such a quantity of people. Rav Steyman took the paper and brushed it like that. Now, Shtemon was extremely gentle and polite. And he looked at him and said, this is a waste of money. He said, if you want to spend your money in a way that will make a difference, get 60 Jews to get along with each other. That'll be a lot more important. My friend told this to me himself. Not, uh, I saw in books, they brought down the story, and they say, get 6 million people to get along with each other. That's never happening. Uh, he, told him, he told him 60. So get 60 Jews. Zohar Kadosh says that if there would be Knishta Chada, Knishta is ten, if there would be ten people, that have Ava Vachva Benehem, Moshiach would have came already. If Moshiach didn't come, that means we can't even get ten. There are families that have ten boys. That means we can't even get ten brothers to get along. But it's not because we're bad. It has nothing to do with being bad. Feeling, oh, we're so evil. It's not. Hashem made a person with certain animalistic instincts. That's the way it is. And people naturally are jealous and naturally can't see somebody else succeed, definitely if they're struggling. And that's, that's human nature. And it takes a lifetime to even work on one of those. Imagine working on all of them. But we do have to understand. The Gaon writes, I quoted this many times in different contexts, the Torah will not dwell. I'm quoting word for word about Ella Ela only in somebody Shehu rekam midot raot is empty of bad character traits, umalei b'midot tovot, and it's full of good character traits. If you see somebody who seems to know a lot of shas and poskim and he speaks well and whatever, but he's arrogant. A kid comes to ask him a question, he ignores him. He says, I don't have time. He runs away. Call him to speak some way. How many people are going to be there? Then you know the Torah is all fake. It's just like you learned biology or whatever. It's all fake. Shalot tishkona Torah, the Gaon says. The Torah will not dwell. It's impossible. Real Torah can't dwell. Ella, only b'mishu rekam mimidot raot. It's completely empty of bad character traits. Umalei b'midot tavot. And that's why you see the way G'dolei Yisrael behaved. M'chaim Shmulev is the I didn't know him personally. My father learned by him for many years. My uncle's the Tzal. Learned by him for many years. My Rebbe was his Chavrusa for many years. Shani Badel Chaim Tavim Malukim. Chaim Shulavitz would walk to the yeshiva. It was a very short walk from where he lived. Wasn't if there was a mother carrying a baby, or with a wife, then the carriages were less popular. Most mothers carried their babies, and the baby was crying. Just from hearing the voice of a baby crying, which, by the way, is not even a bad thing. It's actually healthy for babies to cry. They developed their airways and many other medical benefits. Not excessively, but within reason. Chaim Shulavitz couldn't hear another Jew suffering, and he would start crying as well. And this wouldn't happen once a day or once a lifetime countless times a day. If he walked 10 minutes that day because he went twice back and forth to the yeshiva, or if the student stood with him outside talking to him and learning, so now he stood outside for an hour, he could start crying 40, 40 times in the middle. Because he wasn't capable of hearing the tears of another Jew. Those were the delays. Their heart was so big. 
I saw Rav Shach burst out crying when people would tell him problems. More than once, many, many times. I had the schut to be Rav Shach a lot, many times, that's why. I was once by him when a guy came into him to tell him that he was in a car accident and he was, uh, got saved with a miracle, huh? but he, one thing happened that he limps a little bit as a result. He had a bunch of surgeries, huh? he limps as a result. And it's bothering him in Shaduchim a little bit. Rav Shach held his hand and cried for 20 minutes. 20 minutes by Avshach is like saying 20 lifetimes by us. Avshach used every second of his life, calculated to the T. 20 minutes straight, held his hand and cried. Then at the end he told him, if you ever have a shidduch and that's the problem, tell the girl to come to me. I Meaning not only did he care, he also took responsibility that he's going to solve the problem. I don't know what the end of the story is. That was the part I saw. Beyond that, I have no idea. But these were G'dolei Ado. Ovadia didn't sleep for weeks, his son testified, except for falling asleep on the Sfarim the way, way he was, when there was Agunot after the wars in Israel that needed Heter Agunot. He wrote thousands of Heter Agunot. Weeks straight, he didn't sleep, because these women are Bitsar. Wait, instead of wait three more hours. What is it? They need him, he doesn't need them. He said, How could I sleep? How could I eat? Another Jewish woman's Bitsar. Didn't even cross. That's why Ravadi was Ravadi. That's why 56 of his Sfarim are in every Jewish home in the world. And like that, all the dilemma of all the generations. I'm just saying examples of people that lived amongst us. So that we know that this is obtainable in this generation. I can tell you countless times. My Rebbe called me at the weirdest hours of the day and night. I don't understand. What does he want from me? And it was only when I actually like, digested what was going on, I realized. He knew exactly what time it was, and he knew I might be asleep or might be awake, and it maybe even will wake me up. And I, I know all the fantasies. He goes, nah, it's not nice to bother. This is that. All that I know. But earlier in the day, he spoke to me, and he got a vibe that maybe I'm a little bit weak. Maybe I'm not feeling so well. He's sure everything's okay. You need a doctor, maybe. Maybe, I'll, I, maybe you don't want to go to the doctor. You don't want to hear what he has to say. I'll encourage you. Don't worry about it. Tiniest detail, the stupidest thing. Once, I don't know why he called me, I said, Rabbi, I'm sorry, can I call you back in five minutes? So he, he said, sure. I said, I'm really embarrassed, really forgive me, I'm just in a clothing store, I ordered a bunch of shirts and I have to try them on. I was embarrassed, that's what I'm doing, but I had no choice, it was either that or lose a lot of money. Maybe I should be embarrassed about that part too. Um, fine, he said, sure, what's the problem? You know, whenever you want, call me back. I forgot to call him back. Half an hour later, the phone rings, I see his name, I wanted to bury myself, I was driving, I, I almost lost control of the car. It's like, you read me, the shirts, the shirts are burnt with the store, what is it? you crazy, what's wrong with you? I pick up the phone, I don't, I'm like, I don't even want to say hello, I'm so embarrassed, I, I'm stuttering practically, I'm like, Rebbe, I'm sorry, I forgot, whatever. He said, ah, stuyot, stupidity, that's not important. He says, tell me what shirts you got, were they nice, what colors, what this? Did it come out well? Did it fit well? Did this? So he was asking, so I answered. This one came out like that. This one came out like that. This one was a little tight. He says, oh, chaval, now you're going to have to go back again. It's going to take more time. Maybe you should tell him to ship it to you. He said, don't worry about the few dollars. Hashem's going to send it. It'll save you going back and forth the time. You could do other things in that time. That's what interest he took in the tiniest details. When I made my first simcha, my daughter's about mitzvah many years ago. He asked me to come to Israel to bring in the pictures of the invitations and the flowers and this, that, to, before I order it to make sure it's nice enough. And he's busy telling me he thinks this matches better to that and that matches better to that. The person who learned to Reb Chaim Shmulevitz or Reb Nochum Patsovitz Chavuta including Kabbalah gave shiurim on th Wednesdays and Thursday nights that all the Kabbalists of Israel would come here from all over Israel including all the brand names that people go to for blessings. And he's busy looking at, this invitation matches this napkin better, you should pick this way. And once I told him, Rebbe, really? I'm embarrassed, you know, this is what you're busy with? I said, I shouldn't be busy with this, you're busy with this, the whole thing makes no sense. And he told me, the chazonish was greater than me, that's for sure. And the chazonish also sat with people to match buttons to their clothing. Because if it's important to you, it's my mitzvah, and you're not going to take away my mitzvah. That's somebody who cares. Those are the people that have peace in life. And you can't fight with them even if they want to. What are you arguing about? All he wants is to shower you with good and good and more good and more good and more good and more good. 
before he passed away once. So I was in the hospital and I, I knew he had trouble eating, but he was, he was able to eat a little bit at least at that point still. And I remember that for many years when I used to come to him, I used to always bring food with, him, with me because I knew it would be at least 12, 15 hours we'd sit together at a time. So, you know, you get hungry in the middle. So it was, uh, I'd go to the bakery that I thought he liked and I bought all different things and brought it. And so I offered him a certain piece of cake that over the years I bought him many times. And I told him, Alav, ina ugash ta'ev, this is the cake that you like. So at first he tells me it's hard for me to eat. It's not worth it for me, it's hard for me to eat. Also, I don't know if the doctor agrees, you know, white flour, this, that. He was very sick then. So I told him, Arav, you know, ksat matok bape, you know, something sweet in the mouth, sometimes give chizuk. It's a tough situation, in the hospital for months already, and that. He, he brushed me off. He doesn't want to eat, he doesn't want to eat. I figured he's not feeling well. I went back to the hotel that night, and I was going to go back the next morning to be with him for another. And the only reason why I would go back to the hotel wasn't because I wanted to. His condition that I could visit him is, is that by a certain hour I leave to go to the hotel, to sleep, to have a normal shower, to this, to that, and the hotel has to be a nice hotel, and all the criteria, and then I could come back. But if not, then you're not welcome here. Because even in, on his deathbed, he was worrying about our comforts in life. <laughs> so when I come back the next day, before I go into his room, so I was in the hallway, waiting to go into the room, because this protocols, whatever, with people that have certain situations. And the doctors also were inside. It's rude to walk in like that. And it's one of his sons is outside. And he calls me and he says, you got to hear something. I know my father's going to be very upset that I'm telling this to you, but I can't keep it in. Don't, just don't tell him I told you. So I said, okay, what do you want? And I'm already scared. Like, what am I going to hear now? You know, it was my life. Was every word was Kodesh Kodashi. He says, my father told me what happened yesterday with the cake. And he told me he was very torn on what to do. <laughs> if to tell you the whole story or not. He doesn't like cake. He just knows you like cake. And he was always scared that over the years when you came to him, you would sit and not eat because you'd be embarrassed because of him. So he would tell you that he likes this cake and that cake and the other, so you should feel comfortable to eat. Well, we said, no, he could have been teaching, he could have said, Chloe and Mia for another 4,000 boys, like his brother does all the time. He was a Rosh Shiva. He left being a Rosh Shiva just to sit and eat cake with people like me. Because he had such a big heart, such a big care, such a big achayut towards every detail of every person in Kali So much compassion. He was willing to give it all just for the sake of somebody else. By the way, we know this from Chazal also. Listen to a pasuk with a Rashi and tell me what you make out of it. So you know, it's, I don't say anything. I'll tell you what it says. And I'll do it, deal with it however you wish. The Torah says in the parasha, Moshe like, talks to Hashem. Yifkod Hashem elokei haruchot lekol basar ish alayda. Moshe Rabbeinu knew he was dying. Right? We speak again this week about Moshe Rabbeinu's death. And he tells Hashem, I'm the leader of Am Yisrael, so we need somebody to replace me when I'm going to die. Because God told him he's dying, he's not going into Israel. But listen to how he terms it. Not just find somebody, you know, appoint the leader instead of me. Asher Yetzei Lifnam is going to go be in front of them, being the leader. Asher Yavo Lifnam is going to come back. You have to understand what all these words mean. The Torah doesn't have one extra word. Asher Yotziyem, Asher Yeviyem. Again, it seems like so repetitious. And God's nation shouldn't be like a herd without a leader. This is Moshe Rabbeinu's prayer to Hashem before he dies. Comes Rashi and says, what does it say in the Pasuk? Yifkod Hashem Yifkod Hashem. What's Elokei HaRuchot? The God of the spirits? What does spirits have to do with anything and in the Torah, there's no extra word. So if Moshe Rabbeinu termed something this way, and the Torah quoted it, Lanetz, for eternity. If God, okay, oh God, that means there's a meaning to it. So Rashi was bothered by that. Rashi says like this, Elokei Aruchot, Lama Neemar, quoting from inside. Why does it say Elokei Aruchot? 
Why? It's extra words. Amar lefanav, Moshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, Ribono Sheolah, Master of the World, Gadui v'yadua lefanecha, it's known to you. Da'ato shal kol adam v'adam, shal kol echad v'echad, sorry. Every person's daya, every person's thoughts. Ve'inam domim zeh lezeh, no two people are alike. Manea lehem manhig, appoint on them a leader, now listen to Rashi's criteria of what it means to be a leader. That will be able to tolerate each person based on his personality. Moshe Rabbeinu, the one who brought the Torah down from Shemayim Tam Yisrael, when he gives the criteria of what it takes to be a leader, he says, a leader is somebody that knows how to go with the other person's way. Not somebody who stands on the stage up front and preaches his way. Knows how to go with the ruach shall call each va'ish. Based on, and that's why he called him Elokei Aruchot. The God who knows all the spirits, each neshama, each nefesh, exactly the way he is, what this person needs, what that person, each person's need. That's who could be a leader. I want to take it a step further. We're all leaders. Today, if you're a Jew that's Shomet Shabbat, you're a leader. Whichever way you want to dice it. And the reason why you're a leader is, because whether you like it or not, when you walk on the street, people look at you and take an example from you, to the good or the bad. And judge every breath you take and every everything. If you would know how many trivial comments I get from all over the world about the weirdest things, from videos that I'm on or whatever, things I'm embarrassed to say, like stupidities, craziness. Once somebody sent me an email asking me if I'm an Avelut because I didn't shave for two weeks because I was lazy. You know, like the craziest things in the world. <laughs> Unbelievable. That means people look at you with a magnifying glass. So we're all leaders. A leader is she has Silvel. So You'd be able to tolerate each person. And today people don't make it easy to tolerate them. I thought in the 90s, when I was uh, in the yeah, early 90s, when I was, uh, you know, in my mid and end of my teen years, I uh, thought then it was hard to tolerate things. Now I look back, I'm like, I shouldn't send those days back. That was Gan Eden. What would you give us over here? What would you give us over here? But yeah, if Hashem says that that's what it takes to be a leader and He put us in positions that people view us as leaders in one way or the other, then that means we could do it. But it takes pikhut, it takes wisdom. You have to have a, you have to have a certain... How to use your head, simply put. It's funny, we use our heads. We have good heads, all of us. Yiddish a cup, they say. But we use it to make money for college. These are all important things. I'm not downplaying them. I'm a big believer in education and finance and everything. It's very important. But uh, when it comes to how to deal with people, we forget to use our head. Why do you care to tell the other person he's right, even though he's crazy? There you go. Bothers you? I don't know. I was walking now in Queens. I went to buy pizza when I got here. I didn't know they were serving pizza tonight, but I came late anyway, so it's fine. Um, and I, on the, there was some guy, I guess he's homeless. I don't know what he is, but uh, he was living in a, car, a wet cardboard box, it looked like, based on what, the way he was situated. And I, it didn't look like he was completely there either. And he asked me for money. So I told, he said, asked me for money for food. So I told him, I'm going into the pizza shop, come in with me and take whatever you want. Money for drugs, I'm not interested in giving him, but money for food, I do want to give him. So come in, take the whole store, whatever you want. So he got a little bit upset at me. He says, you know who I am? I said, no, tell me, who are you? He tells me, I'm Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I told him? I said, I am so honored to feed Messiah. Please come in and let me feed you. <laughs> what am I going to do, fight with the guy? Argue with him, have him curse me out that I'm Jewish and didn't give him money. I worked with his craziness. Messiah, Messiah, fine, whatever you want. I should have maybe also called 911 to put him into Bellevue at the same time, but uh, maybe that would have been responsible. But these days 911 doesn't want to work either because, you know, they defunded them, so I don't know if you can call them anymore. But, um, yeah, you have to sometimes know. Chatam Sofes is la To give him mshuga. To give a crazy person his craziness is also a mitzvah of chesed, it's a mitzvah of the So he's crazy, you know? 
That's the only way to survive today, because society became nuts, and it's just getting worse by the hour, not, not even by the day anymore. So, okay, that's a mitzvah too, and I'll go along with this mitzvah. Don't be like them, don't learn from them. But you have to fight with each one. <laughs> Gotta know what to say, where to say, and when not to say, and it's a lot harder to know when not to say than to know what yes to say. And that's why I think Chazal said many years ago, siag shtika. In most cases, you're better off just being quiet. Besides, I'm not talking about these liberal babies that find things offensive and whatever. I got a lot of liberal baby viewers, and they know I, that's what I think about them. It's no secret. Grow up, yeah. Sometimes people need to get a little maturity. I identify this way. Why'd you call me that way? No, okay. I identify as a billionaire. Guess what? My bank it still doesn't have billions. What should I do? Uh, that, that nonsense I'm not willing to accept. But I'm talking about, you know, serious things. When a person has a serious so there's a certain pikut, a certain sharpness that a Jew has to have how to deal with people. So there's a known story from the great Rabbi, the Pshisch Rebbe, as it tells, he was one of the great, great Hasidic masters. So he had a friend that was also a Hasidic Rebbe, that they were in touch. And that guy passed away. And normally when a Hasidic Rebbe passes away, his son, today the sons in plural, but let's say son, takes over. That's the way it was done by the Hasidim. This guy's son was, you know, far from a Rebbe, let's just say. Far from a Jew, probably. You know, he wasn't behaving exactly the way a Jew should behave. So, of course, he didn't, and he wasn't interested in being a Rebbe. So, the father died, and there was no continuation. But years later, the guy was making money, and then suddenly he lost his living. And he realized Hasidic Rebbe's make a good income. So, uh, you know, they come for blessings, they leave money, and that. So, he decided he wants to be a Rebbe. Take over his father's job. He's the Rebbe's son. But he knew he can't just one day say he's a Rebbe. So he needs backing from other rabbis. Now, his father's friend was this, the Pshisla Rebbe. So he says he's going to go to him. And he's going to tell him about his plan. But what's he going to tell him? I, I want to be a Rebbe because I'm money hungry. It's not going to work. So he came to him with a nice made-up story. He said, Rebbe, listen. My father came to me in a dream last night and told me that in Shamayim they decided that it's time for me to reveal myself and I should take over his leadership, and I should get dressed the way he used to get dressed, and blessed the way he would bless, and, that, and he would back me from Shemayim. And, and so I think that maybe I have to listen to my father and become a Rebbe. He played that card, you know, the backwards card. Now what's, a, what's the Rebbe going to tell him? You're a nobody, get out of here. He's going to insult him. What, what are we going to gain by that? Tell him, okay, for sure he can't do. That's going to be even worse. So how does a smart Jew do, deal with somebody like that? He tells them, listen, I agree with you. And I think it's an amazing idea. But there's just one problem. If you're going to go tell people that story, nobody's going to believe you. Because why should they? People don't believe in dreams. And even if they do believe you had such a dream, the Gemara says, dreams don't mean anything in most cases. Uh, it's not going to work. So I have a plan. You don't listen to your father. And then he's going to be upset. Why didn't you listen? He told you to become Rebbe. So he's going to come back to you in a dream. So when he comes back to you in a dream to ask you why you didn't listen, tell him that I said that nobody's going to believe you. So therefore, he should go to all the people in a dream and they should come crown you to be a Rebbe. And with that, he never became a Rebbe. Very similar to many, many, many years later, I wasn't feeling all this week. Hashem should watch over and protect the whole generation. So he once, one morning, woke up and, made it and told his grandson to bring wine and cake. That's what he does when he makes a siyum. And he made a siyum on the whole shas. Now, Chaim uh, siyum on shas is Erev Pesach. This was an Erev Pesach. So, and Chaim has a very methodical learning schedule. So it was funny. So the grandson asked him, well, what is this? So he said, though, last night, when he slept, the Chaim sleeps for two hours and 20 minutes a night. During his two hours and 20 minutes, he learned the whole shas in his sleep. He reviewed the whole shas in his sleep. So he has a siyuma shas. He finished shas. So he's making a siyuma shas. Wow. Okay. Of course, the story made wins. It was published everywhere. Of Zilberstein said it in a speech. It was published in Kolbe Lama. It was here and there. Everywhere. A few weeks later, the Kolbe guy comes into Chaim Kanievsky to ask him a local question. Rabbi, what do I do? Last night I slept for a few hours and in my sleep I reviewed the whole shas. Should I make a siyum or not? You understand already. So what's the Chaim going to tell him? 
So if Chaim tells him, of course you have to make a siyum. But being that you learned Shas in a dream, you should make the siyum in the dream too. Chakim <laughs> <laughs> Don't fight with him. Don't argue with him. Don't tell him you're wrong. You're stupid. What nonsense are you talking? For what? You're just going to cause conflict. Work around it. You know, figure out the... I don't even call it politically correct because I'm not into that. But uh, figure out the wise way to approach the story or to defuse it versus the way that's just going to raise people's agitation and other things. And not only is it not going to defuse anything, it's going to make things worse. And I end off, I promised you another quote from the Kutzker Rebbe. So this is my message for tonight. The Kutzker Rebbe once was telling his Talmidim what he's going to do when Mashiach comes. So, he told them that Mashiach's going to come. And when Mashiach comes, the tzaddikim are going to go running to greet him. The average people will be somewhere in the middle. Those who are not so righteous are going to start running away a little bit, because they'll be embarrassed. That kind of simple, I think, right? And then he paused, and everybody's looking at the Rebbe, like he's saying such obvious stuff. Like, Kotzko was very sharp, he didn't. And he said, I'm going to wait until after Mashiach greets all the Rishayim also. I'm not going to go greet him. Now everybody's shocked, what? I'm yourselves waiting 2,000 years in exile, almost 2,000 years in exile for Mashiach to come. You're, gonna, you're proud to say, I'm going to wait. For... He says, you know why I'm going to wait? I'm going to wait because at the end Mashiach's going to look for me. Because I was the Marad Atra, I was the rabbi over here. He's going to want to know where I am. And he's going to find me. He'll find me in the Bet Midrash, sitting and learning. And he's going to come over to me. And you know what he's going to tell me? He's going to say, everybody came to greet me. Where were you? And you know what I'm going to answer? For 1900 years, the Jewish nation was waiting for you too. Where were you? <laughs> A little peace. And we'll be able to do the same soon. Amen. Shabbat shalom.